Okay, so uh, continuing on from our talk last time, back to substitution, we're going to go with another failed proof. All right, in this case, I'm going to start with uh, t of n less than or equal to 2, t of n over 2 plus 1. I'm going to try to prove that this recurrence, for this recurrence relation, that function t of n is linear. t of n is big O of n. That is, t of n is less than or equal to c times n for some constant n and sufficiently large n. Okay? All right, so for some constant c and sufficiently large n, right? So we're going to try to prove it inductively. We're going to assume that for all k values less than n, t of k is uh, less than or equal to c times k. I'm going to take my recurrence relation. I'm going to plug in, hey, n over 2 is less than n. So great, since n over 2 is less than n, I can plug in my induction. And uh, then I just have some algebra. And I'm left trying to prove is c times n plus 1 less than or equal to c times n. That's true if and only if 1 is less than or equal to 0, and that's going to fail. And that is never true. No matter what c you have, there's not even a c in there anymore. Okay? So that fails. Now, as I was saying last time, before, the, uh, before I was interrupted, let's say, um, what does a failed proof imply? Does it imply that the thing you're trying to prove is false? Does the failed proof that I just gave for t of n is big O of n, does that failed proof imply that t of n is not big O of n? No, it doesn't. Of course, if the thing you're trying to prove is false, the proof had better fail, right? If your proof goes through and proves something false, something's wrong. Some, something's, something's wrong with your method of proof. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't like that to happen, okay? A failed proof proves nothing, okay? So what happens when we have a big failed proof? One thing that we could do is we could sort of go back to the equation we have and just, well, let's try a bigger guess, right? Didn't work to prove that t of n is O of n. What about proving that t of n is O of n squared, right? So this just takes what I had n before is now n squared. What was k before is now k squared. Now I'm going to substitute in. Hey, c of k, k equals n over 2 squared, just like before. We work out some new algebra. And hey, this is great. It works out. It works. No matter what positive c you give me for sufficiently large n, that is n larger than or equal to 4 divided by 3c, or the ceiling of that for our n naught value, for any n that large or larger, uh, we're going to have t of n less than or equal to c n squared. And we've proven not only that t of n is big O of n squared, but that t of n is little o of n squared. Not surprising, since last time we saw t of n less than or equal to 2t n over 2 plus n is also little o of n squared. So making this function smaller, not surprising that we're still strictly upper bounded by an n squared function. So let's come back to our failed proof, though. Uh, maybe going from n all the way up to n squared is too big a jump. Maybe we just had to make it like a little bit bigger, right? I mean, what if we try a slightly bigger guess? Instead of going, you know, c n squared, what happens if we go to like, uh, let's prove that t of n is less than or equal to, I don't know, c times n plus 1. Let's try that. Hey, if we do that, great c times n plus 1. Our inductive hypothesis is going to change a little bit. We're going to plug it in over here. Hey, t of n over 2. n over 2 is less than n. It's less than c times n over 2 plus 1. Hey, c times n over 2 plus 1. We've plugged that all in. We work our, our, out our algebra. Now I have is c times n plus 2c plus 1 less than or equal to c times n plus 1. Cancel out the cn from both sides. I'm left with 2c on the left and 1c on the right. Cancel one of those c's out. And I'm left with is c plus 1 less than or equal to 0. No, that's still not true. In fact, it's more wrong than before. Before, we needed sort of 1 to be less than or equal to 0. Now, I need a positive c plus 1 to be less than or equal to 0. Or more wrong than before. Uh, but that's not so disheartening because it actually gives us the way to make this true. Somehow, by making this function a little bit bigger, we failed. What happens if we make it a little bit smaller? What happens if then instead of c times n plus 1, we go with c times n minus 1? Hey, we can do that. We do that. All these just a few signs change. 
bing, we knock a few signs off, and it turns out, hey, now I subtracted off 2c over here, and this all works out great. This holds if c equals 1. Okay? So we've proven that t of n is less than or equal to c times n minus 1 for c equals 1 and n at least 1. And if that's the case, t of n, well, we know that c times n minus 1 is less than c times n. So we know that t of n is less than or equal to c times n minus 1, and that's less than, or we know that t of n is less than or equal to 1 times n minus 1, and that's less than or equal to n, and so we know t of n is less than or equal to n, and in fact, t of n is linear. How did the proof change? We had a hard time proving inductively that t of n was less than or equal to c times n. We had an even slightly harder time proving that t of n was less than or equal to c times n plus 1, and yet the inductive proof that t of n was less than or equal to c times n minus 1 went right through, no problems at all. Why? We proved a stronger statement, which sounds like it should be harder, but it's an inductive proof. When you have an inductive proof and you're trying to prove a stronger statement, you get to use a stronger inductive hypothesis. In fact, in this time, when we subtracted off our c term, the thing we're trying to prove subtracted off that c term once, but the, thing, the inductive hypothesis, we actually got to subtract it off twice, right? We used the inductive hypothesis twice, so we subtracted off two units of c, and everything went through just fine, right? So that's nice. We can take this approach, the substitution method approach, and use it for a sort of weirder looking recurrence relations, right? So here's a recurrence relation which doesn't look quite as nice as the ones that we've been seeing. It's a well-known recurrence relation. T of n less than or equal to t times n over 5 plus t times 7 over 10 plus n, okay? So here you go. There's some recurrence relation, and uh, you want to prove that this recurrence relation has a linear solution, that t of n is big O of n. You want to prove it inductively. Now notice, uh, we're going to, just like before, we're going to assume that this thing holds, and now what happens? Well, first of all, warning. I've seen too many people do this. Do not sort of treat this as t of n is less than or equal to t n over 5 plus n, and in addition, t of n is less than or equal to t of 7n divided by 10 plus n. And for each of those, we get some solution. And since each of those solutions holds, let's add them together and sort of hope it works out. This is a completely wrong way to approach the problem. Instead, we're going to just substitute in exactly the way we were doing before. We have this recurrence relation. And now we go, hey, t of n over 5, inductively, I know that for k equals n over 5, t of n over 5 is less than or equal to c n over 5. So I'm going to plug that term in right here. t of n over 5, c n over 5. Also know that for k equals 7 over 10, hey, that's also less than n. So t of 7 n over 10 is less than or equal to c, or t of 7 n over 10 is less than or equal to c 7 n over 10. So for this term, I'm going to plug in over here. And then my plus n term is still a plus n. Then we're right back to where we were before. We're going to use algebra to take this thing and try to show that it is less than or equal to c of n. All right, I'll leave that, leave that to you to finish if you want. But we want to take the exact same approach that we've been taking last time. All right, nothing, nothing really different here. Okay, so the next question, well, where did these guesses come from? Where did my n squared, where did my n, where did those things come from? Uh, well, one possibility is they're actual guesses. The other possibility is that they're, you know, you worked it out a bit and you have a, 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 an educated guess. You know, how can you get an educated guess? That'll be the, uh, that'll be the next video.